When you think of the Anglo-American tradition, I think you think of freedom, rights, liberties, the liberties of Englishmen, the Bill of Rights. You don't think about our nationalist heritage, but it exists and it is quite strong. But it is nationalist in a sense that is different from the stereotype. The stereotype of nationalist you know, comes from, uh, comes from the, uh, the continent of Europe, comes from the, uh, the evil exemplars of the Nazis. Um, but the idea in people's minds of nationalism is something that seeks to exclude the outsider. It will define the nation narrowly and focus its energies on excluding those who are without, outside of that narrow definition. Nationalism in this stereotype term is about who we're against. The Anglo-American tradition of nationalism seeks to unite the nation under a broad definition and bind them together through language and culture and shared citizenship. And it is very much about who we are for. It is a different emphasis with the same idea. In particular, the Anglo-American nationalist tradition seeks to overcome three possible dividing lines in society. Dividing line number one is race, blood, national origin. In the Anglo, in the continental tradition, very often, if you were seen as an immigrant, someone with the wrong national origin, someone with the wrong blood, you were that outsider. And nationalism was going to come and get you. In the Anglo-American tradition, it's immigrants who were often the leaders of the nationalism, the leaders of binding their nations together and setting forth a national purpose and a national goal. Regional differences. Europe has been split by regional differences, regional debates accented by language. In the Anglo-American tradition, nationalists have sought to bind together the regions under one strong nation. And finally, class. Here there's more of a history on the, on the communist left, but class divisions are something Anglo-American nationalism has always sought to overcome, to bind the classes together under one nation. And for these reasons, when we speak about this Anglo-American nationalist tradition, we often call it one nation conservatism, because it is about binding everyone together under one nation. Secondly, in addition to being about uniting people, overcoming divisions of race, overcoming divisions of region, overcoming divisions of class, the Anglo-American nationalist tradition sees a role for government, a role for government in overcoming these divisions, a role for government in binding the people together, and a role for government in making the nation great. I would argue that our Nationalist tradition is not one that seeks to make government so small you can drown it in a bathtub. That is foreign to this nationalist tradition. It is one that sees a central role for government with limits to bind the nation together and achieve national greatness. I want to discuss this tradition by using five examples off and on. Um, our English examples are uh, Edmund Burke and Benjamin Disraeli. And our American examples will be Alexander, Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, and Abraham Lincoln. Much of what I say, much of this tradition, I think, intentionally or not, informed or not, was something that Donald Trump tapped into, was something that he modernized, but he was not something new on the Anglo-American political scene. To the extent he brought a nationalist perspective to our country, he was actually tapping into parts of these traditions and bringing them forward to our present day. Let's start with defining the nation, overcoming divisions of race and blood. I want to quote a uh, British, uh, the great British uh, poet, the great British great British uh, singer, Morrissey. I'm not quoting him for his politics. Um, he is a British nationalist, an English nationalist, but one who I think misunderstands his own traditions and has actually, um, has actually uh, uh, made comments, taken positions with which I, I strongly disagree. But 
One of his most popular songs is an autobiographical song called Irish Blood, English Heart. He says, Irish blood, English heart, this I'm made of. And he goes on to describe how he's looking forward to a day when we can stand by the flag not feeling shameful. It's the beginning of his nationalist transformation, but at the heart of it is his acknowledgement that while he has an English heart, he's got, the, he's got the different blood, he has Irish blood. In no way does that prevent him from seeing himself as an Englishman first and foremost. And that's the model going back in time. Edmund Burke, Irish blood, English heart. He never denied his Irish blood, but he always described himself as an Englishman. And it was to the grandeur and glory of England that he devoted his political career. Benjamin Disraeli, my personal hero. We're going to hear more about him soon. Jewish blood, English heart. He was, father converted him to Christianity at the age of 12, but he never denied his Jewish blood. When attacked for his Jewish blood in Parliament, he responded quite well and quite forcefully. But he devoted his life, how did he put it? He said, my politics are described by one word, and that word is England. He devoted his life to the English nation, to the English empire. His English heart is what guided and dominated his politics. I would add that this tradition continues down to the present day. Lots of the leaders in the conservative party today are people who are from recent immigrant families. So you look at uh, British Home Secretary Priti Patel. She's the daughter of Ugandan Indian immigrants. She's a Tory. She's a Thatcherite. She's one of the leading figures in the Vote Leave campaign. Uh, Sajid Javid, health secretary, son of Pakistani immigrants, Tory, Thatcherite, was largely sympathetic to Brexit until he wasn't. Interesting story, though, about Javid's youth. Javid's father was a big fan of Margaret Thatcher. And his story is told that his father brought him to meet Thatcher at a Conservative Party fundraiser when he was in his late 20s, Javid. And he impressed Thatcher, and Thatcher turned to him and said at this meeting, Sajid, you will protect our great island. And that there, that sentence is the Anglo-American nationalist tradition. Who will protect our nation? Who is not only part of our nation, but one who will lead it and protect it? Sajid, the son of Pakistani immigrants. Because blood is irrelevant. Heart is what matters. He has a British heart, an English heart. Crossing the waters to America, the same thing. It was never about your blood in America. How could it be? So many people came with so many different types of blood. Alexander Hamilton, a new book is out claiming that Alexander Hamilton was Jewish. Don't know about that. But he definitely was an immigrant. And he definitely was the leading nationalist among the founding fathers. Uh, but of course, Abraham Lincoln is the one who really set forth this idea of blood being irrelevant to your American nationalism uh, in his electric cord speech of 1858. Um, there he acknowledged that many Americans were immigrants who shared no common blood with the authors of the Declaration of Independence. And he said that was irrelevant. He said, if you identify with the moral sentiments of the Declaration, you are Americans as though you were the blood of the blood and the flesh of the flesh of the men who wrote that Declaration. What a powerful statement about what really matters and what really unites us as Americans. Secondly, overcoming class differences, class distinctions. This was probably Disraeli's great stroke of genius. He was a leader in the Conservative Party at a time when the Conservative Party, the Tories, represented the landowners, a small percentage of the English population. But the pressure was building to give the vote to more and more of the growing working class in the growing cities of England. This was seen as a threat by every Tory leader. But it was a ticking time bomb. It was inevitable that one day the working class would get the vote and one day the Tories would be overwhelmed. It was Disraeli who saw something in the working class that others didn't see. He saw that they were nationalists in the purest and loftiest sense. 
He said of the British working class, they are proud of belonging to a great country and wish to maintain its greatness. And they believe on the whole that the greatness of England is to be attributed to the ancient institutions of the land. He saw they could be enlisted as a new force to maintain the ancient throne and the memorial monarchy, monarchy of England. Now as he saw in the working class the bulwark of the very nationalism that he was trying to build and grow. He saw in them the national settlements being part of a great country and wishing to maintain its greatness. And he realized that if he could appeal to the British working class, he could get them to become the future of the Conservative Party. This idea is what enabled Conservative parties to survive in the Industrial Age. This idea is what enabled conservatism to thrive in the modern era. He was so confident in this idea that he supported the Reform Act of 1867, which affected the, extended the franchise to the working classes. The conservatives were not immediately rewarded for this gesture. They were trounced in the election of 1868. But eventually, they won an impressive comeback in 1874. Working class voters were a major pillar of conservative support for decades to follow. And if you follow this, they had the, um, the Primrose Leagues, all sorts of ways of incorporating working class English, mixing together with the ruling class landowning English, forming one united Tory conservative party. Um, lessons here for the modern day, which we'll return to shortly. Finally, overcoming regional differences. Um, examples from Burke, examples from Hamilton. Um, I want to focus again on Lincoln, though. Lincoln is this great success story, born in a log cabin. Picked him up, himself up by his own bootstraps, became president of the United States. This is the quintessential American story. And Lincoln himself realized how unusual he was, how fortunate he was. Having grown up in the grinding poverty of frontier Kentucky and Illinois, Indiana and Illinois, he understood that certain things were beyond the control of individuals. He saw the way his father grinded out a living without ever obtaining financial security. And he knew that so long as, as the land where he grew up, as, as long as the states where he grew up were cut off from commerce, without railroads, without canals, without means of getting their produce to markets, they would forever remain a backwater and remain poor. That's why he devoted his life to a regional unity. Fighting the Civil War, he defended regional unity of the United States. But even before the Civil War, he devoted himself to uniting these two parts of the United States under one connected country that would allow prosperity for all. Uh, the historian Gaber Borat <laughs> did a wonderful job in examining this. He points out that Link Lincoln spoke more about economics than slavery over the course of his public life. And he made economics the most substantial part of his campaigning, legislative labors, and private studies outside of his legal work. So this nationalist tradition, examples I just cite, go to the idea that it's always looking to unite, always looking to bring together people, always looking to overcome differences of blood, differences of class, differences of region. I'm going to spend the rest of my time on economic nationalism because these leaders, these nationalist leaders, were economic nationalists and they wanted to use the power of government to further their nations. Quickly start with Burke. Burke was a famous free trader, right? He was friends with Adam Smith. Adam Smith said, this is the one man I know who knows economics. Uh, and yet, Burke was a nationalist, an economic nationalist, who was far more interested in the wealth of his nation than the wealth of nations. During his life, British, the British had an empire, so he pursued national greatness through a mercantile framework. He always consistently supported British commercial monopoly over its colonies. Not free trade, but an arrangement that was good for his nation, England. He prevented British colonies, he was supported preventing British colonies from developing industries that competed with British manufacturing. But where he did not see competition with British manufacturing, he favored premiums to get industry growing, government intervention, industrial policy, 
to get industries going in the colonies so long as they would not compete with British industries. Disraeli famously intervened to create a greater level playing ground between the factory workers and the factory owners. Hamilton, of course, we all know. Hamilton was not against free trade. His great insight is he recognized that Britain, the leading competitor of the day, did not pursue free trade. He recognized they provided bounties, premiums, and other aids to their industries. And he said, so long as Britain is doing this, then the only way we can compete is if we do the same. He said these foreign interventions pose the greatest obstacle of all to the successful prosecution of a new branch of industry in our country. So he wrote his famous report on manufacturers. He advocated an industrial policy, including bounties and protective tariffs. Henry Clay followed his example, the American system. By the way, Clay, same thing. He recognized that America's top trading partners, primarily Britain, were actively intervening in the free market. And so he said that we have to do the same to prevent the inevitable prostration of our industry, which must ensue from the action of foreign policy and legislation. He put forth his American system that strengthened our financial infrastructure, developed our physical infrastructure, and provided protection to our infant industries. And then, of course, Lincoln. Back to Lincoln. His hero, his role model, as he said so often, was Henry Clay. His first speech running for political office, he set forth his political agenda. It was, it was Clay's American program. From, from start to finish, it was Clay's American system. In the House of Representatives in Illinois, he pursued this, this economic system of Henry Clay. He pursued this industrial policy. And when he got to the White House, he pursued this policy. Once in the White House, Lincoln finally brought to completion Clay's goals in a way Clay, Clay never could. He pursued a series of tariffs that raised protection to unprecedented levels. He passed the National Banking Act, which revived the National Bank. Lincoln pursued a series of ambitious internal improvement projects, including the Pacific Railroad Acts, the Land Grant College Act, the Homestead Act. And these policies together began to transform the American economy to the point that by the close of the 19th century, our economy was now greater than that of Great Britain. Got about two minutes left. Am I good there? No? Way, way less. Way less. OK, I'll close in a minute. Pursuing laissez-faire free markets made sense when we were the leading industrial power in the world. That served our interests. It did not when Britain was the leading industrial power in the world. It does not as China emerges as a leading industrial power in the world. Suddenly, we find ourselves in a situation very much resembling that of Hamilton, that of Clay, that of Lincoln. And the answer is the same. The answer is nationalism and economic nationalism. And I'll add to the economic threat, we face divisions again like we never did before. People once again trying to divide us by race. Class distinctions that are widening and growing in part due to our failed economic policies. And regional differences that once again seek to take hope and potential away from regions of our country. The Midwest may now be connected by roads, canals, and bridges. But the factories in the Midwest are no longer producing goods that can be transported on those canals, roads, and bridges. To overcome our divisions of race, to overcome our divisions of class, to overcome our regional divisions, and to fight the economic challenges of our day, which are new and different from what we faced in past decades, it is the Anglo American nationalist tradition that provides the greatest path forward. Thanks.